everybody. Good morning. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Hi. Sam Healy. Welcome back, folks. It's the 31st of October, which means there's only one sixth of the year left. Also, ooh, it's Halloween. It is Halloween. At least he, you know, here in the U.S. is Halloween. It, it, yeah. If you're not from here, it's it's some holiday where uh, forget it. It's not worth explaining. <laughs> no, it's been a, it's been a uh, it, it's a busy day here just because of all the sorts of things that happen. Traffic is high. They don't cancel school on Halloween, and yet they decide that they're going to do costume parties everywhere. And yeah, um, he's got a costume on. I do. Woohoo! Oh, it didn't work. Hang on. I'm wounded. I was just talking about the lack of a tie, but. Um, okay. It's going incognito. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I went downstairs today and the kid said, are you dressed for Halloween? And we, they couldn't tell. So that's a good you thing, I think. Don't you? Don't they see you dressed like this kind of every day, though? I had Co a jacket on, Costume too. party, regular day at work. Uh, I don't know. Well, let's Depends see. on you know, where, which way you drive out of the driveway, really. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Well, there's a lot of stuff going on. We got back from Essen Spiel Fair just this week, and we are behind the behind the curve and getting things done. There's a gazillion games to take a look at, and of course there is news. So let's get started with that. Mm. All right. Now there's a lot of news that has happened this week. Hair, the hair, the hair is what makes it. It's amazing. No, this is good hair. It matches my beard too. Why, no, yeah, the eyebrows are on this Why are your eye eyebrows so far up? That's what I want to know. Hang on, uh, uh, better. That's now, sure. now funny. you have four eyebrows. Four eyebrows. <laughs> You know what? We should probably just do the <laughs> talk about the news. Yeah. That's like a you weird unibrow. <laughs> Tom is perfect. Tom, it's good. It's, it's perfect. Good. Just Tom, let's, it's, let's it's, go. Oh my word! I can't. I can't do it. All right. So <laughs> the news. So first of all, let's take a look here at. I need to wear a hat. All right. Deranged. Deranged here is. Uh, That's a fitting first entry. Yes, this is coming from Hobby World, and it's been picked up and brought to America. And I had the company here, and it's not showing up in the notes. So it's there coming soon. Hobby World's doing it. This is like a game where people are going crazy, turning into werewolves type stuff. Cool. I like the look of it. Hachette La Liver, I think is how you say this. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, they are buying Black Rock Games. They're buying, actually, a majority stake in a company, which is the same thing. Black Rock Games is known. They've done a lot of different games. Uh, King Domino is originally from them, I think, over Blue Orange. Okay. Or what have you. I'm not, I'm not actually quite sure. Or they did King Domino. Uh, this company who bought Black Rock Games has already bought Gigamic. Um, and so now they are made up of Gigamic, Studio H, Funny Fox, and Black Rock. Black Rock is actually quite big over in Europe. People in America haven't heard of them as much, but they make quite a few games there. All right. The Crew. This is a new game, a competitive card game. I think it's from Z-Man Games. Uh, designed by Thomas Singh. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's published by Cosmos. That would probably be the correct term. Uh, 50 missions. You're going to do different tasks communicating with each other. It's called The Crew. You said competitive. I think it's cooperative. Cooperative. I said competitive. This has been useful news. All right, let's get to news I actually do know a little bit more about. There is a new board game cafe being opened up in Chicago from the folks who did Cards, uh, Cards Against Humanity. Okay. They are billing it as the first full-service board game cafe in Chicago, which, as when I saw on the internet, seemed to irritate the cafes that already exist there. Okay. What do they mean by full service, I guess? They're going to have a full dinner menu, craft cocktails, hundreds of board games, and two escape rooms. Wow. They said... We've been, making, money, right? we've been so, making games well, yeah. for almost 10 years now. We've seen that games, food, and theater have an incredible capacity to bring people together and create community. It's been our dream for a long time to do a really ambitious version of a game cafe and share it with people. We hope it doesn't fail in an embarrassing fashion. That's their press release? Oh, they always do stupid press releases okay. like that. You know, they do that. Cards Against Humanity has done a, a dumb Black Friday thing for like the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. They sold poop. 
One year, one year they so if you built it, they would keep digging a big hole in the ground. One year they said, just give us money. They raised the prices on their games. Yeah, one Black Friday, the prices went up and set it down. Yeah. Well, I mean, it works for them. It's yeah, their whatever. gimmick, right? It's a, it's a bit. So here you can reserve a private table with a deposit, which then is applied to food and drink pur purchases. Reservations include access to the building's bank vault, which has been converted into a library for games and a group of teachers. And then there will be two escape rooms there from a group created the House Theater of Chicago. Definitely ambitious. My goodness. Oh, sure, oh. sure. You know, I mean, like, like you said earlier, they got the money. <coughs> A new expansion is coming out for Detective. So the last one went back to the 80s. That was it, the 90s. The 80s. The 80s in LA. Now they have um, this is Detective Modern Crime board game is being re-implemented. Re season one. That too. Um, so this is the same game as Detective. Okay. I think. Are you asking? Uh, oh no. Okay. I see. They're they're actually. This is a do-over of the first game of sorts. Oh, okay. Because okay. it says this is more family friendly, has only three cases, and a shorter playtime of 90 minutes as opposed to the two to three hour playtime of the original game. Huh. It's billing it as perfectly tailored for a mystery game night. Each of the three cases is set in a different setting. I can't tell you how glad I am personally for this. Core box. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is season one, and it looks, oh, I, it looks like they A new story or a repurposed story? Uh, I'm assuming it's a new story because I remember the first story and that doesn't look like it at all. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Well, you okay. <clears throat> um, it's hitting a store in the second half of 2020, so it's a long ways away yet. He uh, announces that his thing at Essen, I think. Yeah, yeah, I saw a box there that had this cover on it. I, I was not sure what it was there, and I'm, I guess I'm still not sure, but we'll figure it out. I'm it's, okay it's if they drop the playtime to 90 minutes and that they're not in a row, so I can just pick one and play it. Sure. I don't need the whole campaign going through. Yeah. Cool. Horrible Games has repurposed itself as Horrible Guild Game Studio. I don't know that that matters that much. I would kind of hope that they would get rid of the horrible part. Well, I think they wanted to keep their logo. And I think they uh, may be tired of being called Horrible Games, which I never thought was a good idea. But right. Horrible Guild Game Studio is a little better. Yeah, that's true. It's just a mouthful. They said, regarding the new name, we think that the word guild better describes us as we are now, a bigger group of people sharing the same goal. And the additional benefit of the change is that finally you won't have to tell your games that we don't actually make horrible games when you introduce one of our games to them. <laughs> We're simply a bunch of silly people with a horrible name doing great games. Fine. <laughs> Which is true. I like their stuff a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Funkoverse put this up on their webpage or somewhere. And that's because it's obviously they're doing Back to the Future as their next thing. Which is a little weird to me because they already do, did Rick and Morty. Which is like the remade version of this. Speaking of which, we're doing a live playthrough of this tomorrow. Of the Funkoverse game. Not this. It would no be, Back to the Future stuff. It would be kind of funny if it wasn't Back to the Future. They just used that format to lay out the different times. Well, I'm sure you released. think that'd be funny, but there'd be a lot of really annoying <laughs> people out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I would not mess with that. Yeah. All right. The Game of Life. The Marvelous Ms. Is it Maisel? I think so. This is a Amazon Prime TV show that's right, done right. very, very well. And it kind of goes against the grain of the Game of Life, so I guess that's what they're doing here, Hasbro Games. Also known as Hasbro Games, trying to make some more money. This is a weird, I mean, I've never seen the show, but what's what, what do you mean it goes against the grain of the Game of Life? Well, the whole thing about this show is that she's a housewife who goes against that. She wants to go out and be, she it. becomes a stand-up comic. Got it, got it. Got and it. Every, so that's what it says here. Maybe you'll get married, have kids, buy a dream home, go to the vacation in the Catskills, and make it as a stand-up comic. Then again, maybe you won't. You could get divorced, bomb at the jokes, and end up in a dumpy apartment. Did you say vomit the jokes? Bomb, bomb at, at the jokes. The jokes yeah. Which that's is better. Not, not too far off. That's better. I don't know that I want to play this game. Uh, you're not sure? Let's get to a game that looks really cool. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure as well. This game looks really neat, actually. It's called Etten, Two Against the World. This is from WizKids. Um, nice. So look at the 
That is a lot of stuff in that game. You are Whoa. a two-headed Etten. That's oh, this is the thing that Sam. This is like a card game, but it's really a board game. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff up there. Woo. But I will say, for Wiz Kids, this looks pretty solid. The game. I also love that cover. That's that's that was kind of a. Is it really? That sounded two meaner the world? than you meant into. I think. No, I no, I meant that as straight as I said it. Wiz Kids is not known for their. Quality control, I don't think. Their games are okay. This one looks pretty good. It does look good. The graphic design looks good. The art looks good. I like the idea of you being a two-headed Etten. Yeah, I wonder if you're playing with a player next to you or something, or if you're just controlling two hands. It, it well, looks it looks like, like you're it looks like you're there. going up against the two opponents that are next to you. See how you have the two boards facing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> looks neat. WizKids is also making Tournament at Avalon. Ooh. This is a companion game for the 2017 Tournament at Camelot. Yeah, yeah. It's a trick-taking game in which players are knights, blah, blah, blah. I think it's the same thing as the first one. It's just that it's a standalone game, but you can combine it with the original game. Yeah. Cool. You can mix or match the sets. 139 cards in this. I've known so, this is happening for a while. Are you excited? Yeah. Looks cool. Does. Very, very little news about this, but at Essen you could see Tokyo Dark Edition. Um, this is a. They turn the lights off? Well, as you can see, um, I'm showing you what you can see at Essen. There's what you can see. You know that the characters will be revealed at different times, and you can see the front cover of the box, and you can see the first monster that has been revealed there. It's Gigazar, but a much meaner looking one of that. So um, what else will be happening in this? Well, they'll be announcing it a little bit at a time. Huh. <laughs> okay, I don't know if this is a reprint, <laughs> if this is a reskin. This is a... 2.0, technically 3.0. What I can say... <sighs> can't see. Well, you what don't I, have to say anything if you're not supposed to. It is a limited edition printing of the game. All right. More information to come. Cool. In news I did not expect at all, Catan World Explorers was announced. This is like this is Pokemon, Pokemon Go, Go sort of type thing. No, but it's a game. It's a massively multiplayer augmented reality game. It transforms the entire Earth into one giant game of Catan. You will explore your world to collect classic Catan resources, brick, lumber, grain, ore, and wool. Some resources will be abundant in your region, while others you'll have to trade for. You'll bargain with entertaining in-game characters who are just as strategic as real-life ones. That's false. That never is true. That, um, they're, not, that they're not entertaining, you mean? <laughs> no, a computer player will never be as strategic as a real-world opponent. They can be tactical. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, wheat for sheep, anyone, please? I think it's funny that they went out of their way to go, wheat for sheep. So that they wouldn't fall into the tired joke, I guess. Team up with old friends and new ones as you strategically construct roads, expand settlements, and race for victory points. So I met the designer of this uh, at Essen, and it looks interesting and good. Uh, is there an audience for this, though? I mean, the whole point of Pokemon Go and the Harry Potter one, I guess, is that you go around and, like, Pokemon, you find these cool little Pokemon. Uh, brand that people really like. Love or hate Pokemon, I mean, it's the joy of finding. Finding brick and wood does not seem like it falls in the same category. Sure, sure, right. And the point of Catan was, you sit around and play a game at the table. This is like, I'm, I'm completely willing to be proven wrong by this. Yeah. I'll give it a whirl. I hope it does well. It just doesn't seem like it will. This is kind of the step I don't want board games to take because it's going further down the digital path, which is counterintuitive to the entire th reason of playing a board game. Well, I don't know that this is even a board. I, got, I don't know what this is. No, it's based on a board game. But, I mean, it. it I just don't. I mean, this, this is going to, I don't know. I just, this is going to encourage people to have their heads in their phones when they could be playing a game around a table. To be fair, this does make people walk around. Pokemon did make people go out that and walk. That's exactly what Pokemon said, and people found a way around doing that, too. Well, some people did, but I know a lot of people went out and did walking sure, for I Pokemon. Get I get it, but 
I like Pokemon Go. I mean, I stopped doing it because just I fell to the wayside. But it was something that was interesting. You go around, oh, look, I found this here. I like yeah. that idea. It's a fad. Well, so is any video game. Sure. I, but, I mean, you do need that constant income. So I hope, again, I hope this works for them. We'll have to wait till there's more information about it anyway. They're definitely rolling it out as a slow release. That's the new, one of the new things that these bigger companies are doing. Cool. Level 7, level seven Omega Protocol has another expansion coming. Hell. This I did not expect. This is in print? Whoa. With the base game of this? Oh, this is the new expansion, Extreme Prejudice. All right. Um, this is out of nowhere, man. I thought it it's an adrenaline-fueled expansion. Ooh. <laughs> Um, includes five new scenarios, three new enemy types, and two new commandos. All you right. will need to go through the army of Spetsnaz and Spetsnaz. confront a Russian. new genetically engineered nightmare. But Tin Man has a hulking mech suit bristling with weapons. Everyone's going to want to use that guy. If you have oh, a mech. The, uh, Spets business. Spetsnaz. And Thoth, a gin scientist with powerful psychotronic abilities and a sworn enemy of Dr. Kronos, the bad guy from the first one. All right. Yeah, yeah. And in sad news, I almost feel like I could do a video of all the different uh, gaming personalities who died this year. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, this is Francis Tresham passed away, like, I think a day before Essen started. He's one of the more influential designers that you may not have heard of, but he's most well known for <laughs> Civilization. Designed that. And he also designed the very first 18X game, 1829. 1829 is not a game a lot of people like today, but it definitely was the yeah. springboard for that whole genre. He also did, as you can see, Revolution and a few others, but it's Civilization in the 18XX genre that he's most well known for. So, alrighty, that is the news. There's other news that is coming or being announced, or there's all kinds of news. At Essen, there was a flurry of news that we could talk about and not talk about. It's like all jumbled together. You'll hear about it soon enough. Nurse, just how bad is it? I see. We'll need to operate immediately. Bring me my tools. What about these? Meeple-shaped dice. Ugh, this doesn't seem to be helping. Still nothing, nurse. Bring me the FOMO. Nothing seems to be working. We're going to have to bring out the big guns. Nurse! Ugh. Clear! I've done all I can. I'm afraid it's too late. He succumbed. Kickstarter. Featured this week is Dwarf Spring by Vesuvius Media, which is for two to four dragon loving dwarves looking to expand their kingdom and fight off monsters to raise adorable little dragonlings for 25 minutes per player. Because nothing says I'm the mightiest dwarf like having to wield a giant dragon. In this deck building game that challenges players to expand their colony through strategic worker placement. This little, I mean, dragon size game starts at $50. Speaking of strategic placement, we have Kohaku by Gold Seal Games that creates a zen-like pond for one to four koi enthusiasts as they draft little fish, frogs, and features for their pools for about 30 to 45 minutes. As players will be working very quickly to ruin their opponent's zen by hate drafting tiles and placing those for killer fish combos in their own pools. Now this little pond of frustrating zen starts at $29. Next up is Beyond Humanity by Three-Headed Monster that takes one to five intergalactic colonists and tasks them at creating the impossible, a new and cooperative colony for about 30 to 180 minutes as this game lets you ride shotgun to its own mechanics, providing you with an interconnected city building system that links up to an app to provide you with 
up-to-date information on the status of your city and influence of your own gameplay. In this democracy-driven city building game that starts at $225. And lastly, we have League of Infamy by Mantic Games, who's looking to recruit two to five scoundrels to take on those dirty underworld jobs. In this story-driven dungeon crawl style game that highlights players' semi-cooperativeness and willing to get those jobs done dirt cheap. Because let's all be honest, who doesn't like playing the villain now and then? This game starts at $97. Thanks so much for joining me this week, guys. If you want to know more about any of the games you saw here today, then join me at gloryhound.com as we talk about all of these Kickstarters in depth and if we would back them or not. It is a live show, so you guys get to participate in those comments and let us know what you guys think. Other than that, I will see you guys all next week. You are about to embark on the Great Crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. And we're going in. Get off the boats, get through the beaches, climb the cliffs, and take out the enemy. This is the way I approach playing war games. I've always got this bravado thing happening, you know, Hollywood, bang, bang, bang. And this game is that. Flying Pig Games and Dream Team Designers Herman Lutman and Fred Manzo have designed a game called Crowbar the Rangers at Point Zook. This is a solitaire game that can be played two people, three people, four people. Usually it's the other way around. And these are your weapons. Now this is a great production. The board is massive. The pieces are fantastic. Now the board is separated into three sections. The sea, the beach, and the cliffs. So here you start in a boat and you got to get on the shores. But before you get on the shores, you're getting shellacked on the boats by German artillery. German artillery and what it sounds like. And you know, when I play the games, I got those sounds in my head. I know it. Because when he plays war games, these are the sounds that go on in his head. This is a push your luck game. So basically, in this game, you can only move in a straight line. So you get off the boat and you just run and you hope you make it. And once you do make it, you gotta climb the cliffs. This is what the cliffs look like. So the point of this game is to take out the artillery that are taking up your friends a few miles down. But as you're climbing the cliffs, this is what's happening. <laughs> Shut up. And when you're sent to that checkpoint, to check out the artillery, is it an artillery? It could be a dummy artillery, it could be rubble, it could be nothing. This game is all about push, 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 go forward, move fast. But events happen. What kind of event, Pa? <laughs> Mostly it's time advance cards. You move one space, sometimes the Germans counterattack. You move two spaces, and once in a blue moon you get relief. You always say that when Marco's on vacation. <laughs> There's more to this game than I'm saying. There are modifiers, that things that happen. Um, the thing, it's, it's not a difficult game. Just follow the sequence of play. And you know what? Christmas is up. And if anybody wanted to try a new war game, this is it. And it even comes with a stocking stuffer, an expansion, where you play as the Germans. <laughs> you know, if you're on defense about a war game, this is the one to try. Give it a shot. Crowbar, Herman Lutman, Fred Manzo, Flying Pig Games. And you know what? You can actually say you've played a con sim because this actually happened. Abstracted though, but it happened. June 6th, 1944. The liberation of Europe began. Crowbar, the Rangers at Point Zuck. Herman Lutman, Fred Manzo, Flying Pig Games. I'll see you next week. I'm going to share with you three things that gamers should never do or say to their friends. The truth is, like, this list is from things that have happened to me before I was really into gaming that I didn't like and that I have started doing to my friends. Number one, don't invite your new friend to a regular game group and play a regular game. It's going to make that new gamer feel very awkward and like the odd man out and really in behind and like they have no idea what's going on. So. Invite them to the game group, play a new game. 
That's new to everybody, so you're all on an equal playing field. Number two, never tell your friend that the game is gonna be easy. Because it sounds like you might be doubting their intelligence a little bit, or it could be misunderstood that way. It might not be easy for them. We as gamers are used to learning different parts of games quickly. The more you play games, the easier new games are to learn. A game that's easy to you may be hard. And it might make them feel very like, oh gosh, this is really hard. And then they said it was easy. I don't know. It might just make them feel bad. So just avoid the word easy and just tell them, I think you might like this game. Let's try it. Go with something like that. The third tip is to never make them go first. No matter what the game specifies, whether it's the youngest player or whatever it is, just bypass this rule. Don't even make a big deal about it. And just let someone else go before them so that they're not on the spot. If they're not used to playing games, that first turn can be really intimidating, especially if they're the first player. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching the Dice Tower. And I hope you guys have a great day. And if you'd like to see more of my videos, go ahead and check them out on Almost a Board Gamer. Oh, I still didn't get it right. Tom, you're in this. Oh, this is so awkward. Go ahead. It's close. It's close, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, let's talk about Essen. That's closer. That's much closer, yes. All right. This is bothering me a little. Yes, it's not comfortable. I've worn that uh, a couple of times, and it's... Uh, you wore this for the, the Battling Tops thing, didn't I did. <laughs> Yes, he did. I did. That's more comfortable than the mask that covers your face, though. Guaranteed. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, it is. Because I've worn one of those, and they're hot. Hey, we're talking about Essen. This is the picture at the end of Essen that we took when we were yeah, yeah. taking the booth down. And these were not everybody who was at the booth, but many of us. And we're mostly smiling because it was over. I mean, I like Essen. It's fantastic, but it's a very tiring convention. Very um, much so. So definitely more people there than ever before. They said 209,000. That's kind of hazy numbering because it is turnstile, but it's not. You can't just divide it by four either. Correct. Because right. there's a lot of people who only come for one or two. There's a lot of people I know for sure only come two days. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thursday and Friday. They or the or, or the weekend only. Yeah, or the weekend only. Yeah. Saturday was definitely the most crowded day. And I walked in Hall 3 on Saturday. At one point, I had to get over there. Fool of a took. Oh, it's like, if you don't like crowds, I really would have to say I don't recommend Essen for you. Sure. Nope. Because there's almost nowhere. This year, they opened the far door, which, by the way, was great. Um, but because of that, the Hall 6, which is the hall of everything else, has miniature games, uh, has... Uh, like comic strange, book stuff, like, vinyl, yeah, comics and vinyl books, records. Vinyl records. That's true. Uh, weird, we <laughs> weird drinks and weird foods. Yeah. And yeah, it's a catch-all kind of, which is neat. It's really fun to walk around that one because it's you never know what you're gonna see next. Right. Yeah. It is good, but that used to be last year for sure. I went to that hall when I didn't want to be around crowds, and there was crowds there too. Yep. Sure. There was crowds everywhere. So Essen has one, two, three, four, five. Well. I guess six halls because they're now they we used to have to count them because they would be numbered somewhat differently than an actual number of halls. Right. But now they're numbered one through six, and there's also a hall seven, but it's just a big empty hall. And hall where eight. they stuff everybody. And hall eight, yeah. 
There's seven and eight. They're both empty, though, right? Yes. And they just stuffed everybody in there before they opened the doors and let everybody in. Mm -hmm. Right. It is the longest convention when it comes to days, hours during the day. Starts at 10, although so many people are in there as exhibitors that it feels like it felt as busy as, say, Origins before it even opened. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. There's people, I was like, is it open? Is it not open? I'm not sure. Then I was like, oh, it wasn't open. Yeah. <laughs> and then they closed at 7, but they didn't kick people out till 7.15. For sure. Yeah. And even then, it's kind of like a real <laughs> they just turn mild the, kicking people they out. They turn the lights off, you know. Yeah, they dim the lights a little bit, but it is, it's supposed to be done at 7. But people are in there, it feels like, till 7.30-ish, kind of yeah. wander out. It's real... Nebulous when it comes to that. Yeah, it was uh, it was really fun. Uh, we had a lot of good times. The number of games there was tremendous. Yeah, tons of games. Definitely a cult of the new, like everything else. The new games are the ones being showcased. They always well, talk about yeah. the games that win the. They have the DSP there, and Wingspan won that. So, yeah. I didn't actually see a ton of Wingspan being played, though. Ooh. Oh, you did? Yeah. Over in Hall uh, 4. In Hall 4, they had a big setup with oh, okay. Wingspan in German plastered all over and tons of tables showing it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, then, I mean, I, I, to, as in, uh, one of the things that I like and don't like at the same time is how it's, there's a gazillion things. Every time I go through a hall, I see something new, but it's really easy to miss stuff. Yes. I know there's a couple publishers I didn't go by and see, and mm -hmm. I tried. You know, to see everything. I know there's things I didn't... Like Sam said, there was, you know, vinyl there. I never even saw that booth. Yeah. Well, I mean... It, it, was, it was really kind of in the back of Hall 6. Well, it sure, but I mean, I try to go look, hunt that stuff path, down, right? Yeah. I did find a little pug game, though. <laughs> the, the pugs dressed up like warriors and going oh, through and fighting stuff. that one. Yeah. And then I meant to go back mm -hmm. and pick up a copy of it, and I forgot. Yeah. It just, it's so big. Yeah, it's definitely overwhelming, not just being surrounded by people, but if you spot anything you and you intend to come back, you you probably should take a note of where that thing is as in actually write it down or Very take a picture. So. Well, someone showed me an app, and I have to figure out where this app is, that you put the games you want, and it will walk you through the hall, tell That's you where to go cool. next. That's neat. Yeah. And I wouldn't. you normally recommend that at a con, but at Essen you really do need it. Yeah, it's very large. Very it's true. easy to get turned around. Very easy. Yeah, everything looks very similar, especially in those smaller, those smaller halls, because all the all the all the booths are the same size. They all kind of have the same kind of look to them, um, except for you know different company names. You can get turned around and lost really easy. Yeah, thankfully, the ma the 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 maps that they put up very rudimentary sort of layout. Yeah. And when you're switching from one hall to the other, are, they're actually very useful. I like the way those look. Because not only are they showing you, you're about to walk through this door in this hall, but they have an arrow pointing at that, and they, then you can see in relation where the other halls are. That saves me several times. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, walk out of here, make a right into hall two. Got yeah. it. Yep, yep, and they yep. also, at the entrance to each hall, they have a map that shows, I mean, uh, a thing that shows you all the names of the publishers there. So I'd say, is this the hall that, you know, Horrible was in? Oh, yeah, okay, they're in this hall. Or they're really? not. I never even noticed that. I didn't either. Yeah, no, I looked for that sometimes because I was like, I think the publishers in this hall, they are good. And that's exactly where they are. That and there's would have saved that. me. I spent <laughs> probably about an hour on Saturday looking for a publisher. And I, uh, I, I knew about where they were. But, again, everything was just starting to bleed together. And so that would have saved me a lot of... <laughs> Mr. Dreadful says, next year I'm selling treasure maps. <laughs> you stand there, I can help you. For, like a little kid comes up, like, you know, when the fantasy party shows up in the city. Yeah. Like, I'll lead you around. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, okay, Do kid. Do we trust him or kill him? <laughs> oh, <No>. my goodness. <laughs> um, but overall, I think there's a lot of great games. I mean, I was looking at all the games that I, we came back with. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cool games, whether they're all... I still don't know what the quote-unquote hot game of the show was. That's going to continue to become more and more difficult to pinpoint. You know, six to years, find a single game. That's I, what I mean. So many six games years now. ago, you went to a convention. It was a much smaller than this, but also there might be one game, two games that stood out because fewer games were coming out. Mm -hmm. 
with how many games were there, with how many games were being played, uh, and how many people are there to ideally come to a consensus on that, forget that, you know? Uh, that's one of those questions we get asked a lot. What's the hot game? What's the hidden gem? There's a lot of hidden it's, gems. You know. <laughs> Hundreds of them. I think that's also getting harder, though, because what does that entail? Something I wasn't aware of? Was it on my radar at all? There is so much information online about these games that you, if you want to dig in, you can inform yourself about 95% of the games that are there, I think. So it's harder to find one that you play, it's fantastic, and you better pick it up there or it won't, you won't be able to find it again. If it's really good, like Tom says, it's going to get published in a bigger, splashier way. That's just where we are, you know, which is, I guess, good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good, unless you're one of those people who's like, look what I have, they made 100, and you can't get it. <laughs> yeah. it will, it'll come back, you know, if it's really good anyway. Yeah, so, well, someone here mentioned the Magnificent was on the BGG hotness list, the number one on Saturday. I would not ever go by that, and I say this is all, I love Board Game Geek, I like what a lot they do, but a Porta Booth was right around the corner from Board Game Geek. And every year, that proximity to the hotness thing always matters. Yeah, it seems to have quite a, a swaying factor, the proximity to where you go and vote. And it also, it, 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 that's also kind of like a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's uh, just a whoever decides to also stop by Board Game Geek as well. Sure, and some companies had signs. I don't know if you know, some booth said, hey, please go vote for our game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, that, and also games that are shorter, like you're not going to find that the Western Civilization game, that wasn't going to be on the list because no one's going to play that there. Right. right. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, didn't, I never really understood the, the I don't want to say validity, but um, why people would hang so much on that because it is just uh, a, a litmus test of who went and voted. It's not... Well, it does give you some... I mean, I'm not going to say it's worthless. I think it's, it's a, a great, data. No, no, no. I think course, it's a great discovery tool. I just wouldn't put so much stock into <coughs> which one ended up at one and which one ended up at six. Correct. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, and then again, there might be a game that comes out afterwards that blows everyone away, and there's a game there that's growing in popularity. Sure, sure. There's games that sell out really quickly. Mm -hmm. Therefore... They're not going to get a lot of buzz because they're gone. And right. people will also be irritated that this game sold out. But I never worried about that. All the games that sold out, there were still other games to get. Mm -hmm. If you wanted games from last year, you could get those for huge percentages off of what they were. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, not just at the secondhand stores, but at a booth. Like, for example, we were right across from Renegade. Oh, yeah. They had games from last year for half the price they were last year. Mm -hmm. So if you can hold on as a board gamer and buy only games from the year before, mm. you, you could buy games for a whole lot cheaper. Yeah, and if you can figure out how to do that, then tell us. How to hold on, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, but, uh, but I do think it's a nice way to fill in something you missed. I think that's great. You can go over to Renegade's booth and buy their new oddness, but then also look over here and say, hey, look. I missed that. That looks really good. Never did get around to playing that or, or purchasing it. I'll pick it up. It's half off or it's 10 euros or something. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, that's a nice way to, to avoid that sort of feeling like you were saying of it's all about new games or games that aren't even out yet. You, you know, a game that's a year old getting a discount, that's nice. You, that game is perfectly valid. Well, those are first impressions of Essen. I had a good time. Thanks to everyone who came and said hi to us, which was about a million of you, and even though there was only 209,000 people there, at least 200,000 of them said hi to us, and that was nice. That seems so, about right. Yeah. Thank you, and let's keep moving. <laughs> What's up, everyone? My name is Melissa McCack, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love, and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week, I want to talk about Dead by Daylight. Dead by Daylight is a video game where you're either playing the murderer or the people trying to escape. I tend to like to play the person who's trying to escape and pretty much you're just running around activating generators that way you can unveil where the exit is and run away without getting caught by the murderer who's, you know, trying to kill you. Anyway, I would like to connect that to... Not Alone. 
Not Alone is a really cool board game where it's pretty much a one versus all hidden movement style game. The way both of them connect for me is this sort of push your luck element in both of the games, right? So in Not Alone, you might be uh, one of the players who is trying to avoid the alien who is trying to assimilate you to the planet. And you might push your luck a little in terms of which locations you choose to go to and think, no way the person will think I actually went there, right? Um, and same thing with Dead by Daylight, where you're pushing your luck, trying to activate these generators, making all this noise, trying to avoid the murderer. I love both of these games. They both have so much tension in them. And uh, especially in Dead by Daylight, I actually get freaked out. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, this is Steven from Board Game Weekend. Today we're going to look at some upgrades for the Quacks of Quedlingburg and the expansion The Herb Witches. Let's have a look. The first upgrade that I have for the Quacks of Quedlingburg is for the cardboard tokens. Originally you're drawing these from your bag and eventually the image starts to wear off and they get stuck in the corners. But what Board Game Geek has is these geek bits and this is heat transfer process to fuse the image of the uh, token there onto this plastic and it has such a nice tactile feel to it when you're drawing them from your bag and you know that these are going to last a long time and it just makes the game that much more enjoyable and that much longer lasting. The next upgrade features a Plano box from Amazon that has this nice snap-on lid and inside it has these dividers that organizes all of the tokens that you will be purchasing. And it's very convenient when you're buying a specific token, you have to dig around in the colors anymore. Now they are all organized very neatly and it also includes room for the tokens for the Herb Witches expansion as well. And the final thing that I upgraded for the Quacks of Quedlinburg is the bags, which are originally these little black drawstring bags, and sometimes the tokens got stuck in the corners, and also you couldn't really tell whose bag was whose. But on Amazon, you can get these nice drawstring bags that are color-coded for the player colors, and they are nice and velvet, and you can open them, and they're nice and big enough to fit your hand all the way down in there, nice and you can hold all the player items in here very easily. And I've found that the tokens don't get stuck in the corners of these bags either. Okay, everyone, those are my upgrades for the Quacks from Quedlinburg. Hopefully you found some of those interesting. Let me know in the comments below if you have any extra add-ons that you have for Quacks that I didn't mention. Until next time, we'll see you. Thanks for watching. Hi, everyone. My name's Danielle from the YouTube channel Board Game Bakes. You may notice that there's a kitchen behind me instead of the usual stack of board games. And that's because on my channel, Board Game Bakes, I teach people how to make edible components from some of their favorite games. One of my favorite creations is an edible Carcassonne board. Carcassonne is a very fun game to play, and I'd be happy playing it anytime. And one of the best things about starting out making a Carcassonne board is that you just do squares. Just cut out lots of squares. I use the vanilla almond sugar cookie recipe. You cut out all the squares, and then you decorate them. To begin, I outline the cookie in black, and then depending on the cookie that I was doing, I either did roads or buildings or a combination of the both in order to create a piece that looked like the game board. Next, I used my green icing with the flooding consistency to fill in all of the grass areas. I'm filling in the grass, just filling in the grass. After all of your cookies have grass in the right places, it's time to start filling in the buildings. So take your brown thin royal icing and fill in all the spots that are left for the building. Now it's time to finally see your work come together with adding some accents. The first one I do is red, which is mainly just adding roofs to some of the buildings on the fortresses and some houses. Next, we're going to use the green color to add in grasses in different places. Ta-da! Here's our completed board. Thanks for watching this overview of how to make your own edible carcassonne board. For more details on the recipe and to just see more edible creations you can make, check me out on Board Game Bakes and hit subscribe. Bye! Hey everyone, today on To Paint or Not To Paint, I'm going to take you through Run, Fight or Die Reloaded. 
Hey everyone, Matt here from The Plastic Canvas and welcome to To Paint or Not To Paint, a series where I quickly take you through a game and then talk about whether I think it's worth spending the time to paint the miniatures in it or not. And today we're taking a look at Run Fodder Die Reloaded. This is a reprint of the 2014 version of this game where players are taking on the role of a survivor in the zombie apocalypse and then through dice rolling very similar to King of Tokyo, you'll be taking out waves of zombies or sending them off to join the horde that are attacking other survivors. So is this game worth painting? Well, in the last video in this series, I looked at Zombie 15, and even though I loved the pants off that game, I did give it a no in the end, purely because of the nature of the game. The players that are playing it are so frantic, and the zombies are on the board, off the board, on the board, off the board. The time that you spent painting those minis just didn't have the impact that you want it to. This game doesn't have that problem, though. The minis spend a lot more time on the table, they do get noticed, and so the time that you've put into it does have an impact. But the main reason that I'd say yes for this game is because of how painting them up to look like zombies really brings out the theme and ties everything together. Because this is quite a light-hearted zombie game. There isn't the blood and gore and horror that there is in other games. But out of the box, the male and female minis are bright orange and blue. And I'm guessing the cartoonishness of that is to tie in with the feeling of the game, which is fine. But for me, it just doesn't quite look right on the table. But painting them up, making them look like zombies, adding a bit of blood here and there, really just brings the game to life and makes everything look right on the table. But as you're painting them, you don't have to do lots of blood and gore and paint them as you might say zombie side. You can still keep it quite lighthearted, which is what I did. I had quite a bright skin tone. I had quite a bit of yellow mixed in there, tried to keep the colors of the clothes quite light as well. So it kept in with the, the feeling. So if you'd like to see the full review for this game, go check out the Dice Tower review. And if you'd like to see me painting some minis, including Run, Fight or Die Reloaded, go check out my channel, The Plastic Canvas, and I hope you guys enjoy your breakfast. What's the country? Tahiti. That, that's um, Jamaica. Libya. Aruba? It's Europe. Switzerland. The Spain. Netherlands. Spain. It's actually Italy. I was so getting there. It's a pile of spaghetti. France. Wow. I don't, what? I don't know enough about Italy snacks. Italia. It could be spaghetti ice cream. Oh don't word, mention don't that. Jason don't will burst up. through that window right now and be like, somebody say spaghetti ice cream? That's true. Alrighty. It's just ice cream, push put, through a machine, put through. So we have, and then it all melts together again in like two minutes. Yes. Pagusta, these are tomato flavored potato chips. Pagusto, il gusto, e dei curiosi. A curious taste. These are two the, crisps. The these are like soft potato chips. We have Fonzies. These are. Hey. <laughs> I, I, I did not <laughs> yes, uh, these are corn bites with white cheddar cheese. Corn bites with white cheddar cheese. Oh, this that looks actually good. sounds good. This is um, Crostini Dorati Vivaci. They're bite sized. Crostini's? What? Italian toast with paprika flavor. That looks really good. That does look good. And then we got the croissant. I, I'm just not going to try to pronounce chocolate anymore. Buttery and flaky croissants filled with rich chocolate cream. Chocolato. That's what that says. Huh? That's and then this is a fruity soccer themed gummy treat. Ah, el soccer themed? Goleador. Then there's this lacquer wafer, which looks very <laughs> Wait, similar. A lacquer wafer? This looks very similar to like the thing we get in every package anymore. Yes, yes. yes. Well, every country makes that. <laughs> this is in Spanish. These are called Ringo cookies. Ringo They're, Star? I, yeah, I know. Um, it's a crispy vanilla and chocolate wafer sandwiched together with decadent chocolate cream, not just chocolate cream. That sounds good. This is weird. We it got mixed milk. Italy. But it's in That's English a, and Spanish. 
chocolate sponge cake and Duplo chocolate. El Duplo. That's hazelnuts. Can you like build on top of the Duplo yeah, chocolate? Yeah, you have enough. Yeah. Make a log house. Right. And then eat your way out of it. <laughs> right, I want to try those tomato chips. Tomato chips? These That's things? the big bag, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, tomato chips. I'm turning off my microphone like I always do. Because it's disgusting. I wanna, oh, no, I'm going to give you guys the Bye. theater in the round. It's a round sound, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Go. They smell like ketchup chips. These are ketchup chips. Ketchup chips. Definitely not just tomato. This is ketchup. Well, ketchup is with a bunch of stuff added to it. Wait, what? Really? Including sugar. <laughs> Tomatoes have sugar? No. Yeah, ketchup is ketchup does. Tomatoes and sugar, basically, right? Really? I guess I can make my own ketchup now. You can. Yeah. If you can make it cheaper, then you can buy a bottle of ketchup. You let me know. No, no, no. That's not bad. It's I don't good. think it's really ketchup. It's 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 like halfway between. I would eat these. It's more like mustard. Obviously. Yes, I know. I know. Okay, what else we got? This is what I'm most interested in. Is that the paprika? Yeah, because I like Melba toast, Whoa. and that's what this looks like. Yeah, I took three. Sue me. No, I'm just... That's not... I, I was, like, woeing because of the shape. Oh. I don't care what you eat. You seem to think I'm concerned with your habits. Why would you woe the shape? It, uh, it's literally right there. See, look. It's the same. You're still rolling, right? I'll wait to hit you later. <laughs> Go ahead. These aren't bad. It's Melba toast, but the flavoring's not that strong, actually. So paprika like tastes like toast. Like I don't know that I would be able to say it was paprika if I hadn't seen it on the cover. Well, close your eyes and eat it again. Hang on. Oh, dang it. Oh, my word. This is how this happened. Toast. Yeah. This is nice breakfast. I'm going to eat this. But it's they, would, they feel like they should go on and be on a salad. Ooh, that would be good. Like croutons salad. or something like that. A fancy salad. All right. Mm. With some of these in it. A salad with some of that. <laughs> these look like crackers that were... Baked instead of fried. Yeah. We have this in America. These are those baked... Baked chips type things. Mm. Mm. These are so bland in comparison. Where'd it go? Try it's waffle thin. Where did it go? There's air. <laughs> like what is? What does he think? I don't oh, just. Oh, this is no man. This isn't. There's. It's like, too thin. They just kind of like you put it as soon as they hit you. Come on, try this. Go, next. Boop. Fonzie, what's up? E. Wow. So why do you keep eating them? Are you not sure you have? Try to get a taste. It doesn't taste like anything. That is not what I was expecting. <laughs> oh, hey, those, you were those expecting look like, the, those, like a little... those Cheeto things, except without the... Oh, maybe that's it. Like pre-dust Cheetos. No, they have white cheddar on them, I think. Yeah, it's white cheddar Cheetos. It's what a... And it doesn't even taste like white cheddar. These are dangerous. <laughs> because... <laughs> Somebody just found a Halloween costume, son. <laughs> what are you, a walrus? Oh, it's <laughs> good. <laughs> This has like the, the stuff on your fingers, but you can't see it, so it's not so You're bad. Right. And then you get it all over everything. I want to try this. Oh, wait. Y'all totally don't get to try this because there's only one in here. <laughs> y'all <laughs> sucks to be y'all. Here. Cut it. Grab, yeah, cut it. <laughs> what, don't you? Okay, what go ahead. What is this going on here? <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Let's pull it apart. But don't squish it too much because there's chocolate up in there. Yeah, pull it. This looks good. I'm going to some for you. I don't eat that much. I don't really want this. This doesn't look good. Mmm. That was good. Don't be hating. Yeah. Like it, it tastes like a hot dog bun huh? with some chocolate cream in it. What kind of hot dog buns are you buying? I'm going back to the air crackers. <laughs> Yeah, because those are so much better. 
Alright. Well, we know these are good because we got them from like 10 other countries. Ooh, Ringo Starr. <laughs> Cacao! Sorry, Sam already made the joke. I did. I know. Be gusto. I, I can't get this open. Why? Oh, it has four. Roy gets to try it. Roy gonna try one? Roy gets one too. I are think you a lot. Excited, little buddy. Come on, He's Roy. Going. No, you guys are pigs. Come here, boy. Come, oh, <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, get it. Come on, dude. Oh, don't cry. Are you crying for real right now? I'll fight you. He's crying, I'll fight you. He's crying. Let me have that mic. Mm. You're going to cry. Mm. You love it? Oh, they're solid! You're good. Now he's crying again, but from happiness, I think. As, as in thick? But you're eating two at the same time, so yes. So? <laughs> it's called e efficiency. You're an animal. <laughs> All right, well, the last thing to this try is, is one of these. Actually. This chocolate is pretty good. Yeah, like, it's not so strong. Yeah. That's why you like it, because you don't like strong chocolate. Right, right. Mm -hmm. What is this? Oh. Wow, what it's a weird mystery. It's a weird shape. It looks like a fruit roll-up type thing, but in the shape of a... Goalpost. It's soccer themed. I guess? I'm good. They're... Hmm. Made from the sweat of real players. <laughs> I think I'm good with those. I'm I don't want to try it. it. Okay, what else? I want to try that. Yeah, well, let's try the Ringo Stars, man. They should come as stars. Well, if you, you want. Sued? It's copyright infringement, yeah. What does a guy show up? You don't call them Ringo Stars, you just call them Ringos and they're in the shape of a star. Dude, those are just Oreos. Yeah, but they're shaped differently, okay? They have a target. Why did you take the one that I just touched? What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. I like to be close to you. Wait, four, three, four. That's right! They found a way around it. Mm. Get it? Around. Around it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Not so. These days, like the cheap Oreos you get at the store when you can't afford the real mm, ones. Knock off. Not even as good as those. This is worse. Mm. It's too much, too much cookie, and the cookie is powdery. And they're a little shortbread, I think. Oh, these taste. They, these taste like Great Value brand. <laughs> they really do. All righty. That's the Walmart. That's the Walmart brand. Yeah. All righty. That's it for our, our snack oh. talk. I think we have some more contributors. Let's jump to them. If you watch the Odd Ones Out YouTube channel video, you'd be familiar with this game, Can't Catch Harry. If you haven't, watch it. It's hilarious. In my segment, I'm going to talk about this game coming up. Hi, it's Stella. The game plays two to six players from ages six and above and good for families. Game is fast paced and super simple. So one person keep on drawing the cards quickly from a deck, pass on a card at a time, till one person collects four of the same cards, then that person quickly grabs one of the figurines in the middle of the table. When this happens, everyone stops passing on cards and grabs a figurine too. These figurines worth different points, Harry the Buck worth the most and a lamp worth negative one. You also get points from collecting four of the same cards, minus any wild card you use. Game is based on episode called Harry the Moth. Cards in the game based on the episodes in the Odd Ones Out channel. One rule in the game says that the person who draw from the deck is the youngest player. So for parents playing with children, this is recommended so they get to see the cards first from the deck before passing on to the next player clockwise. Figurines are made from vinyl rubber, so they should be durable to be played with children. We also play this game as party game late at night after our other heavier strategy games when our brains is pretty much dead by then. 
Well, thanks for watching. We are on the Dice Tower, how to play videos at Mipo University on YouTube. See you next time. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about Cthulhu, the Great Old One. But before we do, let's bridge the gap between board games and health. All right, so Bethany has a goal for herself that she was going to plank by the end of the month for 60 seconds straight. Uh, that's nothing I could do. <laughs> but at the beginning of the month, she was only at 20 seconds. Uh, how about you tell us what happened last time you tried doing this? So I was working out with my sister, and she normally does eight counts, and she wasn't counting out loud, and it felt like a lot longer than eight counts, and eventually I collapsed. She was testing me, and I did it for 42 seconds. Okay, I'm almost there. <laughs> Congratulations. All right, with Cthulhu the Great Old One, this is kind of a set collection uh, card drafting game set in the Cthulhu mythos, or the Lovecraft mythos. This game is very reminiscent to Go Fish, but don't let that fool you. It's still a ton of fun. For those of you who know people who might like lighter games but also love Lovecraft, I can't see them not loving this game. Yeah, there's a really fun kind of end king condition that can happen with Cthulhu coming out in this cultist. Uh, there's a lot of suspense going on. We love it at the higher player counts, especially yeah. four, five, and six. Um, yeah, so it's just a really fun time. Uh, we recommend it. All right, well, this is Ryan, and I'm Bethany, hoping that you have a happy and healthy breakfast. Bye. Hey, I'm Matthew from This Game is Broken, and this is Dead Last, a segment that I do whenever I manage to film one. This week, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about something, as most weeks, and that is two things that I noticed recently that I absolutely loved and really want in... This is too aggressive, I'm sorry. Two things that I really want to happen in more board games that got me like, I just saw these things and I thought, wow, that is super useful, and I appreciated it. There have been many times when I've been punching out a board game in Rage, and I've been popping all the bits and pieces out on the table, and then it says, put these chits here and these tokens here, and you think, I don't know which they are. And there's no, I just, until I start reading that, and it is slightly infuriating because you end up packing your game away in a way that's really ends up not being very helpful, right? But Empires of the North had the names of all the different chits on the punch board. And that was so helpful and so useful. And I can't see it take, other than the extra effort, it doesn't take much any more money. So that's something I'd love to see in more games. And the next thing I noticed in a game called Hadara, which is a game I've really been enjoying. I think you can probably just see it's just there. There's a lot of cards and a lot of stuff going on and you've got to kind of sort everything out. And in the manual, there is a rebox instruction. And I can't tell you the amount of times I've been got one of these games out and you put it back, Viticulture, worst offender. And you go, okay, I've got all those pieces out. How do I get these back in the box? And having a rebox instruction made my life just that little bit easier. That's all I ever want in this world of pain. <laughs> my goodness. You're oh, we're back on. All right. Hey, that's another. You're a monster. Who's a monster? <laughs> you, you were laughing maniacally. Yes. <laughs> oh, you want candy, do you? <laughs> No, I create the monsters. And then release them upon the world to ask for candy from others. Give me candy. Do you Drink. collect all the kids' candy and then divvy it up again? Do you keep some of it? Like, do you tax their candy intake? No, because I don't want any of the candy, but I do some of the candy How do you gets build taken roads away? in your kingdom if you don't tax your kids? <laughs> anyway, this is a dumb conversation. All uh, right. We're going to be back in two hours to do our top ten holiday theme games. What holidays, what themes, you'll see then. So will we, apparently. I'm a little nervous where this one's going to head down. Yeah, I don't know. It should be interesting. Anyway, so come back for that. All right. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. Sam Healy. See you on the flip side, folks. Take care. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.